Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, I'm Tom Carrico, and on behalf of the Center for Strategic International Studies, I want to uh, thank you for joining and, and welcome you to uh, today's event. Uh, it's entitled Rethinking Homeland Defense, Global Integration, Domain Awareness, Information Dominance, and Decision Superiority. Uh, there's a lot going on in that title and we're going to do our best to, uh, to walk through it and dissect it all. Uh, we're going to be talking about homeland defense uh, for North America, uh, both some pressing threats and some recent activities uh, that uh, North American Aerospace Defense Command or NORAD uh, and U.S. Northern Command, or NORTHCOM, uh, are undertaking. And for those watching live, uh, please remember you can submit questions uh, via, via the CSIS uh, registration page, which will then come through to me uh, through the CSIS version of JADC2 and Information Dominance, also known as a little fire tablet, uh, and I'll be able to pose those to our, uh, to our guest speaker. Uh, our speaker today is, of course, uh, General uh, Glenn Van Herc, uh, who has served as commander of NORAD and NORTHCOM for uh, just over a year, since August of 2020. Uh, so General Van Herk, welcome. Uh, we're happy to have you here. We're going to be going through a lot, but first I want to hand it off to you to uh, kick us off uh, with a little bit about your command and, and what's going on with you this week. Great. Thanks, uh, Tom. It's a, it's a privilege to be here to talk about something I'm very passionate about, and that's defending North America and certainly our homeland. Uh, I plan to talk a little bit about uh, the commands, uh, why we're rethinking homeland defense, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, integrated deterrence, our homeland defense design, which relies on layered defense. Uh, and that'll get us to really where we're going to talk about global integration and globally uh, in, uh, integrated uh, the experiments, the uh, information dominance experiments that we've been doing. And so first, the commands. Um, what a privilege and honor it is to command two fantastic commands. NORAD, 63 years old, uh, binational command with the Canadians. Uh, and United States Northern Command, which will be uh, uh, 20 years old, Octo October the 1st of uh, 2022. As you know, it stood up after 9-11. Mm. Uh, NORAD's mission, uh, air defense, really, uh, aerospace warning, aerospace control, and something that many people don't realize is we also have a maritime warning mission. The commands are really, uh, although separate and distinct, I think they're inseparable. And so as I transition to, to Northern Command, uh, it's all about defense of the homeland, uh, defense support of civil authorities, which I view as crucial to homeland defense, and then obviously theater security uh, cooperation uh, for our missions. So the, the why is really why we're rethinking homeland defense. If, I, if you'd asked me this question 10 years ago, the threat to the homeland would have been dramatically different. Uh, over the past 10 years till today, uh, really it started with shock and awe back in uh, uh, Desert Storm 1, if you will, when the the folks around the world watched how the United States of America and our allies and partners uh, projected power. Uh, they understood that if we're allowed to project power forward, uh, that it's not going to end well for them. And so they're creating capabilities to hold the homeland at risk with the intent of destroying our will, delaying or disrupting any forward power projection uh, capabilities. Uh, capabilities that they believe they can execute below the nuclear threshold uh, and uh, achieve their objectives. And so I'm trying to create a new homeland defense design to give decision space to our senior leaders uh, so that we don't find ourselves with limited options that are escalatory in nature, i.e. striking early or responding early, or having an attack on the homeland, which then makes us quickly respond as well. And both of those options, in my mind, are very escalatory. So in my mind, it starts with integrated deterrence. And the Secretary of Defense has talked about this. Uh, it's, that's, that's where I'm focused. It's changing the focus uh, away from solely uh, a kinetic in-game defeat capability to day-to-day -day competition and creating that deterrence on a day-to-day -day basis. And that deterrence is created not only with military capabilities and all domain capabilities, but it's with my fellow combatant commanders, all 11 of them, allies and partners, like-minded nations around the globe, and all levers of influence here uh, with our country and our, our other countries. When I talk about homeland defense as well, it's a layered defense. Homeland defense doesn't start in the homeland. It starts abroad. 
Uh, I don't want to be shooting down cruise missiles over the national capital region. I think that's a little bit late in the process. So I'd like to be engaging or deterring uh, well what I call left of launch and creating opportunities through our allies and partners by sharing of information and data and through all levers of uh, influence that we, uh, that we may have. Uh, so we have to balance those. So the foundation of making all that happen is global integration. It's about taking all strategies, plans, uh, the way we do force design, development, and budgeting, and acquisition, and thinking about the, the global nature of the problems that we face today, creating global dilemmas. Uh, the days of having a single combatant command are really over when they're supported only. Uh, the days of having uh, multiple uh, supported combatant commands, I think, is the way of the future, whether that be for a peer competitor or even a, a rogue actor who has access to uh, information space that creates uh, opportunities for them uh, to challenge across all domains. And so uh, to execute that, you got to have the capabilities to do it. And that's where guide really comes in. The capabilities to collaborate real time or near real time across all domains with all 11 combatant commands in the department to create that decision space. A single pane of glass, if you will, that gives you uh, domain awareness, uh, it gives you, when utilizing machine learning and artificial intelligence, information dominance, and then when provided to the right leader at the various levels from tactical to strategic, what I call decision superiority. And I think using those capabilities, whether it be in day-to-day -day competition, in crisis, or conflict, gives us the ability uh, to achieve our objectives. Well, thank you. Uh, lots going on. Uh, before we get underway, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about something going on this week, and that's, of course, the uh, Afghanistan situation. I know uh, there's some uh, special uh, immigration applications going on there. And I think you have a, a special role there. Well, we've been supporting uh, the special uh, immigrants uh, coming from Afghanistan now for several weeks at uh, Fort Lee, uh, Task Force Eagle. Uh, we're almost approaching 800 that we've supported there. Uh, that's going to expand with the current situation ongoing in uh, Afghanistan to where uh, we're going to take upwards of about 22,000 or so at uh, a couple of different locations. So one location up at uh, Fort McCoy in, uh, in Wisconsin uh, that we're building out right now to uh, receive about 10 to 12,000. And then Fort Bliss, Texas. Uh, we expect to have additional capabilities and capacity uh, here in the next uh, few days to start at Fort McCoy. Uh, and then the next couple of weeks down at Fort Bliss to also house uh, upwards of 22,000 total. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so let me just uh, seize on what you led off with. Uh, the title of this event is Rethinking Homeland Defense. So let's stay at the very high level for right now before we get into the weeds. You know, why is it that we're having to rethink Homeland Defense? You mentioned NORTHCOM was stood up 20 years ago. Why are we re rethinking it now? Well, NORTHCOM was uh, stood up uh, in the response to 9-11 for rogue actors uh, 20 years ago. Uh, those rogue actors today still exist, but as I said, our competitors have changed to hold us uh, uh, you know, at risk in the homeland. Uh, many people think of NORTHCOM as uh, Hurricanes and Wildfires Command uh, because we've uh, continued to do the defense support of civil authorities mission. But as you look at the environment, uh, the threat to the homeland uh, forces us to rethink that now. It's all about giving our senior leaders decision space and creating options uh, so that we don't have to uh, have potentially uh, an escalatory option, such as a, a strike on our homeland, which demands a response or potentially even risks strategic deterrence failure, which is crucial. Uh, both uh, China and Russia have developed very advanced capabilities. Uh, China uh, is a peer with Russia in the uh, cyber and uh, space capabilities. Russia is the primary military threat to the homeland today. Uh, they've de developed capabilities uh, that didn't exist 20 years ago. Capabilities to circumvent our legacy warning systems and capabilities. Very low radar cross-section uh, cruise missiles. Uh, submarines on par with, uh, with our submarines that can uh, uh, you know, be very quiet and present cruise missiles uh, threat to the homeland. They're doing that all, as I said, uh, with the uh, intent to create deterrence for themselves, destroy our will and delay or degrade our ability to project power forward. And so I think we owe it to our nation's uh, senior leaders to have this discussion about what we must defend uh, in the homeland, whether we need to defend it kinetically, whether we can do it through resiliency, we can do it through hardening. Uh, those are all discussions that I'd like to see. You say they, they've been developing new capabilities, but of course they've always had ICBMs and that sort of thing. Uh, you're pointing to something different, right? It's not just the nuclear ICBMs and the big attack you're pointing to something different. 
That's correct, Tom. So for many years, uh, you know, since the 1950s, certainly uh, Russia has had nuclear capabilities uh, to include uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, as you've uh, referred to, and bombers. Uh, the difference is uh, the capabilities today, um, and, and I'm going to take the nuclear piece off the table because those are always there. And to address that, the foundation of homeland defense is our nuclear deterrent. Mm -hmm. I'm talking the additional capabilities, such as uh, conventional cruise missiles that uh, can be launched from over Russia today. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, the range of those cruise missiles required them to uh, either uh, fly a bomber over uh, North American territory or in the even uh, later past, they would uh, have to actually drop a gravity bomb over North America. Those days are over when you can shoot a really low radar cross-section uh, cruise missile from over Russian territory that will challenge our existing warning systems today. They continue to develop uh, additional capabilities, uh, nuclear-powered uh, capabilities that can nearly fly uh, forever, if you will, because of the nuclear-powered uh, engine. Not nuclear detonation, nuclear-powered engine. So uh, those are challenges that we're facing. So but let, me, let me pull on that because it's, you're, you're taking the nuclear off the table, you're putting aside the ICBMs and focusing on really non-nuclear cruise missile attack. Walk me through why that's important to them and what is the scenario? You've alluded to it, but walk me through a little bit of why that makes strategic sense for them. Yeah, so I would expand it beyond just cruise missiles. So it could be cyber capabilities, it could be space capabilities. Uh, there, there are many capabilities, but why it's important to them is to uh, delay and disrupt, as I talked about, and they believe they can destroy our will. So in, I don't believe they're gonna attack us out of the blue. But in a regional conflict, where they understand if we're allowed, as you've witnessed uh, us do several times, to take months to build up a conventional force, uh, that if we're allowed to do that and then project power in a regional crisis or conflict, uh, that that won't turn out well for them. And actually, uh, I would tell you that they've watched us uh, change some regimes around the globe uh, for uh, several years now, decades. Uh, and Putin would believe that that may be uh, a potential and so in the case like this, he doesn't really have anything to lose to disrupt or delay once he knows that we're going to be in a regional crisis able to uh, uh, inflict our um, objectives upon him uh, to delay and disrupt and destroy our will. He believes that he can do that with uh, his conventional capabilities. And not only does he believe it, it's in their doctrine. They have stated it publicly. Uh, they have demonstrated the capability through several exercises recently uh, just recent, last year, we had more incursions into our air defense identification zones since the end of the Cold War. And not only basic incursions, multi-axis incursions where they stay for hours. And so they're demonstrating that capability to, to create deterrence, but they're also doing it to, to uh, in a crisis, destroy our will and our ability to project power. So you, you've, I've heard you highlight the, the cruise missile threat from Russian bombers really operating in Russian airspace is targeting large parts of North America and in, down into the United States. That's a significant standoff capability. Uh, but just to, to, to pound this point home, the Soviets had slickums, sea launch cruise missiles for a long time. We relied on deterrence. So you're suggesting that there is a deterrence problem here for those kinds of threats. Well, I, I do believe there's a deterrence problem. Uh, for the nuclear deterrence yep. piece, Admiral Richard has got that covered. Uh, nuclear deterrence is a portion of it. Deterrence, though, in my mind, is not just nuclear. Deterrence is, is more broadly. It's all levers of influence that we have, uh, including conventional capabilities. It's about creating doubt. It's getting in, in their gray space, their cognitive space, to either make them believe, uh, yes, they, they, they uh, can achieve their objectives, or no, depending on what you're trying to make them believe. And you can do that through conventional uh, capabilities, through uh, in competition showing that you have the ability to respond in a timely manner, that you can detect them before they become a threat to you through resiliency, demonstrating the capability to show resilience as a nation if they were going to attack, that you can survive that and also hardening capabilities. And you do that with uh, across the interagency in our nation uh, to, to create doubt that they could ever achieve their success with a strike on our homeland. In a way, the, the phrase that one of our users, non-nuclear air and missile attack with strategic effect. Um, they're trying to get into our gray space. You, the scenario you're laying out is there's some regional fight 
and they hold this at risk or attack this to get into our gray space and affect our political calculus. That, that's correct. To, to, to make us believe that we cannot uh, achieve our objectives or will be late, degraded, or most importantly, they believe they can destroy the will of the American people to respond in that situation. Yeah. On that point, it was, I think, a 2016 Joint Staff document uh, called uh, Joint Operating Environment 2035. And there was this a phrase in it, this was five years ago, uh, that, that highlighted exactly this, that uh, adversaries will threaten the homeland not to physically destroy the United States uh, or even anticipation of material hindering its economic or military potential, but rather to change the decision calculus of leaders. Now, that document, that sounds like what you're talking about. That document's subtitle is 2035, uh, but this isn't a 2035 problem. You're, this is a, a this decade problem now. Yeah, Tom, I would agree with that. It, it is a problem uh, today, and it will grow dramatically over the next 10 years. Russia today uh, has fielded um, two to three of their SEV-class submarines. They'll have nine of them uh, within five to 10 years. Uh, China, as I mentioned earlier, has the cyber and space uh, capabilities on par with Russia, but they're developing the capabilities, the kinetic capabilities, such as submarines and bombers, uh, to do the exact same thing. So we'll have a persistent proximate threat, both off of each coast, and I would say all vectors, 24-7, 365. We've never had that without, uh, when you don't factor in an ICBM nuclear threat, a conventional threat capability that we haven't had to deal with. That will absolutely challenge us to project power globally on our uh, own timeline and place of choosing. So you have highlighted uh, some threats there that are going to potentially come over the pole, uh, over the Arctic. And I wonder if you might speak to some of the activity you're seeing from our strategic competitors, Russia and China, up in the Arctic. What's, what do you see up there? Well, I'll start with Russia. You know, Ru Russia uh, relies heavily uh, economically on the Arctic. They get about 20 to 25 percent of their GDP from the Arctic uh, areas. And so certainly they're, they're, they have a vested interest in being an uh, uh, influencer and in in having power in the Arctic. They have taken what I would call their Cold War infrastructure across the northern portion of Russia and reinvigorated those facilities. Uh, they have already completed their modernization of their nuclear forces uh, and their, their bomber forces. Uh, they have about 54 icebreakers. Uh, some of those are nuclear powered. Uh, they claim their defensive capabilities, but they also clearly have offensive capabilities, not only on, uh, on ships, but also on the land, which you may claim for defensive purposes. They're utilizing those and uh, coming up with policies to say uh, they want to have uh, military members uh, as folks transit uh, the North Passage there uh, on their vessels, which is in violation of international uh, laws and norms and policies. They're trying to change those kinds of things. China's in the same place. They call themselves a near-Arctic nation. Um, just recently, uh, they're in the Arctic right now with their uh, Zhui Long uh, vessel. It's a research vessel, uh, but uh, it's of interest uh, where it goes in the Arctic and, and what they're doing. And so both of them are trying to ensure that they establish rules, norms, behaviors, expected behaviors, uh, and change those to, to their benefit. Russia just took in May the chair of the Arctic Council. They will utilize that position uh, to try to change the influence and the aspects, and, and they'll utilize it to create uh, friction where there's gaps and seams between us and other Arctic nations. And so uh, there is great uh, power competition, or what now we call strategic competition, ongoing in the Arctic. So in an article you published, uh, I think it was this summer, maybe a month or change ago, in War on the Rocks, uh, you highlighted our peer competitors' doctrine, operations, public pronouncements, and demonstrated exercises to suggest that they view the threat or uh, the conduct of conventional attacks on the U.S. homeland uh, as a viable thing. Can you give us some examples of their uh, doctrine, operations, and pronouncements that you're, you're paying attention to? Sure. And when I say that, I'm primarily talking about Russia when I'm talking the homeland. But uh, certainly the aid is incursions that I mentioned earlier that have uh, dramatically uh, gone up at last year. Uh, but Ocean Shield exercise uh, last year uh, in uh, late August, uh, September timeframe, uh, where they took a large uh, portion of their Pacific fleet, operated it right in the uh, our uh, economic exclusion zone, right off of Alaska. You may have re remember where they s uh, surfaced a submarine in the middle of a bunch of fishing vessels up there uh, and actually fired a, uh, a missile uh, from that location. Certainly intended to uh, to demonstrate uh, to uh, the U.S. and others uh, their influence and 
uh, to put them back on the stage, what they believe to would say is a great power. Uh, this summer, their distant summer exercise uh, in the Pacific, uh, where they were surrounding uh, or, or north and uh, west of Hawaii with large uh, naval force and presence and also maritime patrol aircraft uh, as well, the Russians. And so they routinely demonstrate uh, capabilities. Uh, every year for the last five years, Tom, they brought their SEV-class submarine into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and uh, at different times, they go different places, but uh, one year they brought three submarines uh, to include a Kula-class uh, submarine and an Oscar-class submarine. So they're demonstrating uh, not only capability, uh, but they're showing that they have the will to, to utilize it. So we've kind of laid the foundation here and talked about the why in the scenario. Uh, I think you have a video. Uh, if this would be a good time to, to play it for the audience, is this, is this good? It's a great time, so All right. please roll it. All right. Today, the United States and Canada face competitors capable of striking military targets and critical infrastructure in the homelands through both traditional and non-traditional methods of attack. These threats limit our response options and could compromise our ability to surge military forces from North America. NORAD and U.S. Northern Command, in collaboration with all U.S. combatant commands, have executed the third in a series of global information dominance experiments. In partnership with the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Securities Project Maven, and with significant funding and manpower support from the Department of the Air Force's Chief Architect Office. I believe GUIDE will be crucial to enabling a globally integrated deterrence. And what we saw in GUIDE 3 was exactly that, where you can coordinate options in near real time, much faster than we do today. In the competition stage of the experiment, the GUIDE team aggregated early indications and warnings during 120 days of geopolitical events. Real-world alerts indicated adversary actions and led to cross-combatant command collaboration. So the global information dominance experiments are a series of events to allow us to leap forward our capability when it comes to a, the ability to receive domain awareness or early indication and warning on competitor activities, and then to be able to take that information, apply artificial intelligence to it, and garner new insights for decision makers, and then to allow us to be able to collaborate between combatant commands and common data environments to be able to create deterrence responses. In the crisis phase, senior leaders assessed available data to develop rapid courses of action in preparation for deterrence or conflict, while adversaries sought to disrupt allied logistics channels. It was a very eye-opening experience to be able to bring in all of the combatant commands into a single environment, be able to talk with them, be able to collaborate as we developed new plans around the contested logistics vignettes that we saw. In the conflict stage, real-world assets were employed in response to live Red Force threats. We poor deployed uh, capability into Michigan's Alpena uh, Combat Readiness Training Center, and we actually used those players to fuse them into the architecture uh, in the domain awareness tool uh, for operators to make decisions. It proved, one, we can use a cloud-based architecture capability to access data anywhere in the world. So again, we had two C2 operated nodes, one at Tyndall and one in Michigan. Tasking from both locations just showed that they were able to tap into the same data source. So when we talk about uh, cloud-based architecture, it, it's important that no matter where you're at, you have access to that same data. We're talking about real-world data and real-world movements of forces to ensure that the systems that we are fielding today have been checked against actual adversaries and that are giving us real opportunities to decide how to conduct actions faster and to be able to create that deterrent effect. In a future crisis, leveraging these tools to gain decision superiority could mean the difference between peaceful resolution and unintentional escalation. 
I think the tools that we demonstrated are ready to be applied at the operational to strategic level to create time and decision space. It's really great that we've got all the combatant commanders coming together and that NORAD NORTHCOM has uh, served as the banner by which we can all come together to look at global conflict. I appreciate General Van Herc's leadership being able to pull all of that together, uh, which is crucial because any particular activity on one spot of the globe might mean an instant later it's important somewhere else across the globe. And for those of you who think, hey, Guide 3 is done, we've got this artificial intelligence thing licked, <laughs> we've only just begun to fight. So I, th I think you know we we really you know really started to to, to move the ball on the, transforming the Department of Defense, and that is a significant thing. It gives you time and decision space, and that's what we don't have necessarily today. Uh, I can never get enough time as a combatant commander to create deterrence options, create de-escalation options, or defeat options for advice to the chairman, to the secretary, or to the president. All right, well, there, there's a lot going on in that video and we're gonna work through it a little bit. Let me start again at the high level. Uh, and that is, you talked in the video and elsewhere about your goal to create strategic deterrence and defeat options uh, for political and military decision makers. You've talked about how Nor NORAD NORTHCOM in the past have been focused on tactically defeating threats uh, and closing kill chains, things like that faster. What's different, how is it different for you today as opposed to what the, the focus has been on in the past? Well, I believe you hit on it, Tom. First, uh, I don't want to be shooting down uh, cruise missiles or other capabilities uh, over our homeland uh, as a starting point. Certainly, we must be able to do that and figure out what we need to defend, but my goal is to give that decision space uh, to our senior leaders, uh, decision space that they can utilize to create deterrence options. So, for example, uh, if I'm able to uh, see uh, through the capabilities that domain awareness exists today and utilize artificial intelligence and machine learning to give me indications of when a bomber may be uh, planning uh, by looking at cars and parking lots, uh, weaponry around the aircraft. Uh, now I have the opportunity to posture forces as an operational commander or give that information to uh, the Secretary of Defense or the Chairman or the President of the United States to pick up the phone or utilize the information space to create deterrence options. Uh, if required, we can do the same thing in defeat options uh, is to get further left to take offensive actions sooner than being reactive uh, and, and uh, having to shoot down things over our homeland. A couple things there I want to pull on. First of all, when folks hear, you know, you talk about the conventional deterrence gap or something like that, uh, first of all, the reaction might be, wait a minute, isn't strategic deterrence STRATCOM's mission? Right, so, so why is this a you thing, and what's the relationship between what you're thinking about and what you're doing, what's the relationship to Admiral Richard and STRATCOM here? Well, strategic deterrence, the so nuclear deterrence, is absolutely Admiral Richard's uh, job, and he does a great job at that. I, I think deterrence is much more than our nuclear deterrent. Uh, it, it's all levers of influence that we have across uh, the government with our allies and partners, with all 11 combatant commanders. This is about creating global dilemmas to get in their gray space, uh, not just regional uh, challenges. It's about demonstrating uh, the ability, uh, the capability, uh, the, the uh, will to take the actions day to day in competition, that uh, that's where you create that deterrence. And it all involves uh, being able to assess global risk, global resource allocation, uh, and to come up with a collaborative global picture. And I think all 11 combatant commanders are responsible for part of that deterrence as well. So in other words, what you're, what you're pioneering here is something that's gonna have applications across lots of different combatant commands. Absolutely, what we're doing does not solely benefit uh, NORAD and United States Northern Command. It benefits all combatant commanders. It benefits the Department of Defense, the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman, uh, the services. Uh, just as important, providing the data and information benefits our nation's uh, national command authority and uh, senior leaders and allies and partners. Uh, you know, in Guide 3, we brought in some allies and partners to participate as well. And they're crucial for integrated deterrence and part of our uh, homeland defense design for integrated uh, uh, defense as well. So they have to be part of it. We'll come back to some of the details there, but you just again mentioned integrated deterrence yeah, for the second time. And that 
uh, Secretary Austin has, has talked about that as kind of an overarching umbrella concept. Integration means bringing things together into a whole. So what does integrated deterrence mean to you and, and what is being brought together that maybe wasn't integrated before? Well, from a, uh, a military dimension, I'll talk about first. Uh, integrated deterrence would involve operations, activities, investments that we do today that are oftentimes done with a regional focus, not integrated, synchronized, coordinated across a global problem set and an all domain problem set. Integrated deterrence within the military dimension would bring all of that together uh, to include not only uh, utilizing uh, the operations and activities, but also theater security cooperation as well as would be part of that and uh, have uh, effect. Well, I think where uh, Secretary Austin is and where I think uh, we're going as well would be all levers of influence across the nation. Are, are crucial, whether that be, uh, you know, the diplomatic piece of that, whether that be the information piece, the economic piece, all of those have uh, potential impacts on overarching deterrence. And when you bring all of that together in an integrated, coordinated, uh, coordinated and synchronized manner, that's very powerful. Great. Uh, we'll come back to the combatant commands uh, in just a bit, but let's move to the other part of the subtitle of today's event, domain awareness. Okay. Um, you mentioned that, information dominance and global integration. So let's unpack those several things. So talk a little bit, if you would, about NORTHCOM and NORAD on the detection piece, uh, how, what you have, what kind of sensors you have, first in terms of the detection and domain awareness capabilities. Okay, so for NORAD, primarily, uh, we have the North Warning System, a uh, system built back in the, uh, the end, towards the end of the Cold War, updated in the 1980s. Um, that gives us, it's a series of radars, uh, if you will, it's across uh, Canada uh, and Alaska, designed to detect bombers flying at 36,000 feet uh, that had to, back in the days when it was uh, created, uh, fly essentially over the homeland to drop a gravity weapon. Uh, so that is one of the, the sensors. Certainly we have fighters on alert uh, that provide additional radar sensor capability. Uh, we can integrate with undersea capabilities as well. Uh, to detect uh, undersea domain awareness uh, also. Uh, space is a huge piece of domain awareness for me. In my NORAD hat, uh, if there's a ballistic missile launch, my NORAD hat comes on first to provide threat warning. I'll quickly put my NORTHCOM hat on uh, if the missile threat is in, engageable uh, and uh, then put my NORAD hat back on to do an attack assessment. And if it uh, would strike somewhere, put my NORTHCOM hat back on to do consequence management. So you can see how intertwined the two commands are uh, to include for the domain awareness that you're, that you're actually talking about. So could you maybe walk us through, I mean, this is a, lots of things moving quickly, uh, perhaps challenges of picking them up in the first place. Walk us through a little bit the steps involved uh, at the detecting, the tracking, uh, the passing of information. What's the telephone game there, you know? We, in a general sense, this must take some period of time. But what, what are the steps involved there? Well, today I would describe it <clears throat> as analog steps where uh, the radars that I alluded to, so for example, I'll give you a bomber uh, uh, option uh, for a NORAD mission. If a radar detects a, a, a bomber approaching from uh, uh, the north, the east, the west, uh, the first step would be the controller that detects it uh, picking up a telephone to talk to a command center who would then pick up another telephone to talk to either the, uh, the CONAR, uh, which is continental NORAD region, ANAR, the Alaska NORAD region, or CANAR, which is the uh, Canadian NORAD region. Uh, you talk about those sectors. We have two sectors as well. So you're gonna pick up a phone call and finally it'll get to my headquarters uh, through another phone call, which would take minutes to do that. Uh, that's not good enough in my mind. So imagine having a single pane of glass to be able to see that all real time and globally, globally collaborate on response options to something like that. that. That's where we're going. All right, let's stay with the detection and the uh, awareness uh, piece of this right now. Uh, your unfunded requirements, you for list for PB22 had $27 million for radar, an elevated radar talked about uh, for the national capital region. What is that and why is that important for, for this priority? It's a domain awareness. So while we're on uh, domain awareness, that, that radar would give us, uh, in the national capital region, domain awareness to, today is challenged. Challenged by those cruise missiles that I've talked about, which are very low radar cross-section that fly about 500 miles an hour 
and 500 feet or below. That challenges the existing systems that we have, not only in the national capital region, uh, but across Canada and North America and around uh, the, the rest of uh, North America. And so that would be able to give us a proof of concept. Why that's important, Tom, is having that domain awareness, especially in the national capital region, where strategic decisions are made, gives decision space uh, for continuity of uh, government options, for nuclear response options if needed, or those kinds of things. So that's crucial to have. Great. Uh, now, I've heard you, we're, we're going to get into the data and all that sort of thing, but I, I've heard you say that uh, as all these sensors are out there collecting data, that some 90, 98 percent of the, the data is left on the cutting room floors. Of pay. What does that mean? Well, that means that we're not processing all of it. What happens is that the raw data from the, so for example, the radars that I alluded to in the North Warren system, that raw data is not what you're seeing. It, it goes through multiple filters. Uh, and is presented to a, uh, an operator on a radar scope. Uh, what we're finding is that that data, as it goes through filters, is, uh, is not being analyzed. And, and across the board, what we're seeing is a large portion, like you said, about 98% is not. So what we're doing is uh, not asking for necessarily new sensors there, but utilizing software capabilities and artificial intelligence and machine learning and taking the raw data from the radars and assessing that. And what we're finding is uh, when you take that raw data and you combine it with other data, such as from the Federal Aviation Administration or the Secret Service, Capitol Police, that now you're able to create a much better picture and you're able to see the threat much sooner. So you've mentioned the Northern Warning System a couple times. Uh, and you're wanting to leverage all the data that's coming off of that and other, other places. But you also mentioned along the way that it was last updated in the 1980s. Uh, is there maybe some work that needs to be done on making the Northern Warning System sensors better as well? Well, ideally, we would, we would like to go to an advanced uh, system over the horizon radar. The North Warning System is limited in its distance. Radars are limited by over the horizon capabilities, the curvature of the Earth. Uh, which doesn't allow us to see far enough uh, out away from the homeland. And so there's technology today, it's proven technology, that would give us over the horizon radar capability to that domain awareness that we're talking about. I think it's crucial as we, we create new systems that we don't make them singularly focused. Uh, so any new systems that we create must be able to not only detect bombers, but cruise missiles, but even small UAS or UAS kind of systems to be affordable and, uh, and usable. Great. Uh, so you've talked about a data-centric uh, approach. Uh, you're talking about filling in some of the, some of the gaps there. Uh, and the purpose, as I gather, is to, and you've used this phrase, move left of launch. Uh, but you're not talking about left of launch in the sense of going and shwacking the launcher. You're talking about moving left of launch into, the, into their uh, thinking about the launch so as to create that space. Is that right? That, that's exactly right. So. When I say left of launch, it's not in the kinetic realm. It may end up being a kinetic option, but it's really getting left of their launch. So, for example, um, if, if uh, uh, DPRK or, or somebody's going to launch a, uh, a missile, a ballistic missile, the first indication I don't want to be is an OPIR hit for a uh, launch, and that's our overhead persistent infrared capabilities. Uh, I would actually like to be able to get hours if not days further left by watching pattern of life, fusing not only geoint, overhead satellite capability, but signals intelligence collection capability to ensure we fuse that to give us as much decision space as poss possible. So again, I can create deterrence options or we can use the information space. So that's what I mean when I'm talking left of launch. And that's really indications of warning. It is indications and warning, but today the data and the information for the indications and warning that we're talking about is oftentimes not shared. It's not shared across uh, multiple agencies. It's not shared across multiple combatant commanders, and it's not analyzed sometimes for hours, if not days. What I'm talking about is sharing that data, making it available immediately, real time, the raw data, utilizing machines and capability to begin to learn pattern of life and to give you that global and all domain uh, data and information that you can make decisions on. Now, are there new INW data sets that you're working with or trying to develop to make that a reality for your command and for others? I wouldn't say new data sets. What, what I'm, I'm not asking for 
uh, new data. I'm, I'm utilizing yeah. data that exists today that is not processed. But I do need additional domain awareness capabilities, uh, specifically, as I mentioned, over the horizon radar, uh, some undersea capabilities. Uh, and then we, we need uh, all uh, axes and vectors that could attack the homeland. Okay. Move to information dominance. Uh, some, that phrase means different things to, to different people, as does decision superiority. Uh, you've mentioned a couple times, and it was in the video too, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so what does artificial intelligence mean to you in the mission that you're describing, uh, and how is it going to help you get this information dominance that you're aspiring to? Well, to me, artificial intelligence is, is taking uh, data and information and analyzing it with computer and software capabilities to do assessment and analysis. It's not about making decisions at all. But today, oftentimes, that analysis and assessment is made by humans, uh, and we don't have enough and can't build enough an analysts uh, fast enough to do what we need to do. But you can take advantage of uh, computers and software capabilities. Those software capabilities can actually analyze and uh, detect changes in pattern of life or detect changes at an airfield or a submarine base, and then cue a sensor to go look at that or to see if there's additional information that can now present you a warning to you need to go look and pay more uh, close attention to what's going on here. That's really the artificial intelligence aspect. So, so in terms of the, the prospect and the potential to get more out of artificial intelligence to say, hey, go look at this over here. Uh, you know, I, I, there's an example, uh, you know, if you tell a computer an AI to go look at this image, it's a panda. But if they put a little few pixelations in there and to confuse the computer, it's a, it's a stop sign or something. And so isn't there an assumption here that the bad guys won't recognize what we're doing and try to spoof or create noise uh, and pixelate, as it were, what, we know, what they know that we'll be relying upon for this? Certainly, they, they do that today. Uh, that, that is um, a, a technique that you would expect any time. The difference, what I'm talking about is, uh, it's not new data. It's data that is already available today. We're just going to analyze it and assess it uh, much sooner than we do today to present global, near real-time or real-time options. It's not new data. That's, that's what's crucial. So the next piece of this is the global integration thing. So again, integration is one of those words that, that gets thrown around a lot and it kind of means everything to, to mean something different to, to everyone. So when you're talking about global integration across the combatant commands, sharing, collaborating, uh, communicating, other than just holding two phones together, as it were, um, what do you see with, with that? What's your vision there of, of, of a cr the cross-cutting uh, combatant command integration? Well, let, let's just start off with uh, taking the intelligence, it's the indications and warning. Uh, imagine all the, the combatant command uh, J2s, which are the intelligence uh, uh, folks, being able to sit down and assess all domain information in real time and come up with a, a uh, assessment of what's going on by any competitor or potential adversary. And imagine they can hand, handle that assessment uh, to the J3s, now the operations folks, to create options, dilemmas, global dilemmas, de-escalation options. Uh, and they can collaborate in near real time across uh, a single pane of glass, all seeing the same picture. And imagine they can hand that off to the logistics experts, the J4s, if you will, who can assess, is that a feasible option? Are they uh, able to be executed? Is the fuel in the right place? Are the weapons in the right place? Are the platforms in the right place? Uh, and then uh, assess, can we ex execute it? That's what we did in Guide 3. That capability exists today. That's what global integration truly is. It's an assessment of global risk, a look at global resources, the ability to collaborate in near real time across all domains and all combatant commands. That's what I'm talking about. And, and using phrases J3, J4, what you're pointing to is the need to do this at lower levels than what is being done today. Yeah, so today, uh, the example I gave you. So the J2 piece took about 90 minutes. Uh, the way that would be done today is oftentimes a regional look at the problem set. They may pick up the phone and call a couple of combatant commands, uh, work this, but it's going to take hours, if not a couple of days. Then we'll assess to 
produce options. The J3s will produce options. Oftentimes that's a regional focus, regional options, and not all domains. Uh, that, that in the guide two took less than two hours to do. And so in a matter of a half a day, we have assessed it. We've come up with uh, options. The J4 is validated where they're executable. Uh, rather than taking days to produce a PowerPoint brief, and the first time you really globally integrate is at the uh, Joint Chiefs, uh, Combatant Commander, or SecDef level. We're doing that at a much lower level, and you could take that information right there and, uh, and bring in the key decision makers to see it in real time on a single pane of glass. So a single pane of glass, uh, you're talking about this information, everybody's seeing the same thing. It sounds a lot like the aspiration, the vision, the strategy that goes under the name JADC2. So what's the relationship between this and JADC2? Well, I, I think what I'm doing is uh, join all domain command and control. Uh, I, I don't use that because I don't think uh, command and control is what I'm after. I'm after decision superiority, and I'm guessing we're going to talk about that. But decision superiority, whatever you do with the information, I just want to make sure that the right decision maker has a, at the right level, at the right time, has the information. Whether they want to use it for command and control, deterrence options, it's irrelevant. Uh, but it, uh, eventually, this, this is what you would call joint all domain command and control, what we're doing. Now the services have a little bit of a different problem than I do. I'm focused at the operational to strategic level. Uh, they, they have to focus, I think, primarily to the tactical level uh, to develop uh, information and share that information down to individual platforms, such as an individual airplane, uh, a platoon, uh, platforms on the, the sea, et cetera. What I'm trying to do is take the information uh, that you're seeing and share it across at the operational to strategic level to create deterrence and de-escalation options and if needed, uh, defeat options. So you just raised it there. Uh, you've got a different job, you've got different authorities, you've got a different pot of money than the services. So why is this a you thing? Why is this a Northcom thing as opposed to the services? Well, that's, that's a great question. Uh, the first thing I would tell you uh, is I saw the value of data and information, and it was required for me to give decision space uh, to our National Command Authority, our senior leaders. I saw that last year, right after I took command on September 3rd, when we partnered with Space Command and the Air Force to do air, uh, air, ABMS uh, number three, their air battle management system, or uh, number two, air battle management system. Um, <clears throat> At that time, they were, they were really focused on uh, kinetic in-game de in defeat options. And I saw the value right away of a deterrence and getting further left to create decision space like we've talked about. And so I changed our focus to do that. Uh, not that we don't have to do the kinetic kill capability as well, we certainly would. And that's when guide three, or guide one came up in December. And since then, we've gone down uh, uh, this path. Uh, in the end, I'm doing this to change culture, to show right now that the capabilities exist to implement the global integration, our integrated deterrence plan that the secretary talks about, our homeland defense plan that relies on allies and partners in a global perspective, and to get away from regionally uh, focused stovepiped, uh, you know, single domain options. That's why I'm doing it. And to show that this is really ready to go today. So you're pointing in the direction to need to change culture and uses, but presumably this sort of capability you're, that you're pioneering would, would be handed off to someone else at some point. Is that fair? Yes, Tom. I, I would, uh, ultimately the goal is to hand it off uh, to an entity, a uh, single entity within the department. Uh, what I'm concerned about is uh, we slow the process down. As I mentioned, I think we're ready to go, to go faster. Uh, the department is set up what, what I would call in uh, industrial uh, processes to field ships, planes, uh, the acquisition processes. Uh, what we're doing uh, is primarily software based and we're updating the software every 14 days. Our budgeting processes where you have a five-year FIDEP and an annual uh, budget uh, don't fit well into 14-day update cycles and so uh, we have to continue to push to change the culture to adapt to the environment we're in. I would, I would say that's digital transformation. Uh, that's, that's culture change uh, to embrace a digital culture. Well, the, uh, the, the problem of, uh, of acquisition for, for software has been one of the uh, products of study here at CSIS for our Defense Industrial Initiatives Group. Uh, I just want to give that some credit. But to that question, what you're describing, you keep saying go fast, it's important, somebody's got to take the lead here. I mean, it sounds urgent, right? Urgent is the U in Juon, right? So, so this isn't a Juon, it's not a, a Juon, it's just a U thing because it's, it's not getting handled elsewhere in the department, is that right? 
Um, yeah, we, we saw a need to okay. get after uh, the, the integrated deterrence in the, our homeland defense design and to bridge that gap. And so we moved out. Uh, we moved out in partnership with the, some of the agents in the uh, agencies in the department as well. And so I, I do get a sense of urgency. Uh, you know, the next 10 years, the threat to the homeland will dramatically change. I don't think we can uh, continue to do things uh, looking in the rearview mirror. We got to look out the windshield and go forward. And that's what I'm trying to do is change that culture. All right. So um, I guess as I'm listening to the changing the culture, the dramatic uh, threat increase, it's sobering, right? And, and you've come back to say the homeland is not a sanctuary. We have to look at it a little bit more differently. I mean, to me, that just says North America is a region too. And our adversaries see North America not as some special thing, but just as another region into which they can project power. That S certainly. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they're developing the capability. They haven't had it. We've really been the, the only nation uh, capable of projecting power around the globe on our own uh, time and place of choosing. Uh, that's, that's changing. And they understand uh, that they must change to uh, limit our access and influence uh, around the globe. That's how they're going to compete with us. That's how they want to deter us. Uh, that's how they want to destroy our will. So the other implication that I'm picking up here is that you're pointing out how the communication across combatant commands need to take place at a lower level, as opposed to going up and then over to another COCOM. But in a way, you're, you're not just pointing to change the culture of the department, acquisition and the like, but you're also pointing in the direction of perhaps needing to evolve the relationship of the combatant commands and maybe the UCP uh, potentially down the road. Well, I do believe that uh, it's something that we ought to take a look at and make sure there's studies that take a look at what the future of not only conflict would look like, uh, but crisis management and uh, competition. I, I think our combatant command structure today does really well for a, a competition focus day to day. The relationships I have with my counterparts that are in the uh, NORTHCOM AOR uh, with my NORAD counterparts in Canada are crucial. Uh, the, the fellow combat commanders who have those same relationships, that's crucial. Uh, I'm not sure that we'll ever see a single supported combat commander, so it may be worth uh, at some point studying further uh, the future for the UCP for uh, a conflict scenario. Uh, but that's uh, certainly a policy decision. Uh, the president signs the UCP. That's something that uh, I will leave the, to the department. Fair enough, fair enough. All right, so you've alluded several times to the guide Guide 3 experiments. I wonder if you might just introduce what are these Guide 3 or on number 3 that you just uh, engaged this summer. What are these things that were alluded to in the video? Yeah, so Global Information Dominance Experiment number 1 took place in December of uh, 20. Uh, brought four combatant commands together with Project Maven, as you saw in, in the video there, to really kind of a proof of concept about sharing of info and uh, could we get further left, like I asked for, that decision space that I'm, I'm looking for? Uh, what we found was it was incredibly successful uh, to utilize the machine learning and artificial intelligence when shared across uh, multi-domains and, and the four combatant commands. And so I said, hey, let's, let's expand this. Let's try to get all 11 combatant commands. And what I really wanted to do there is show all 11 combatant commands just how valuable data and information was uh, that we could share it and collaborate globally. Uh, that occurred in March of this year. Uh, all 11 combat commands, uh, we had uh, the Jake in there with their capabilities, Project Maven as well. This was experiment two. This is experiment two in March of this year. Uh, incredibly successful. And I've held a debrief at the end of uh, guide two and uh, guide three where the combatant commands all came together. Most of the commanders came together and we talked about the value of what we we're seeing and uh, never heard any pushback. Actually, it was, why don't we have this now? Uh, can't we get this fielded now? Guide three, what we wanted to focus on, and that occurred in July, just last month, was expanding with some allies and partners included uh, to challenge not only uh, the ops piece or the intel piece, but the contested logistics to create options uh, and bring data from service readiness in uh, platform readiness uh, and collaborate in an example such as the Panama Canal is closed. How can you, how quickly can you uh, come up with uh, options for your logistics flow? And what we saw is uh, having the data and the, the ability to collaborate globally across all combatant commands in real time is invaluable. Well, on that point, we just got a question 
uh, from Rachel in Australia. I'm, I'm not sure more than that. Uh, but Rachel in Australia wants to know that, that given that allies have lots of unique capabilities that could be brought to bear here, is there some intent to bring them in? I know you mentioned some uh, involvement or, or, or witnessing of some of these experiments. Is there an intent to, to expand this further? Absolutely, we must. Uh, when you talk about integrated deterrence and our homeland defense design, which is layered defense, which relies on allies and partners, like-minded nations, absolutely they must be part of it. Good. Um, so let's move to, uh, uh, I think, another topic, is there, unless there's more on the, the guide experiments. Oh, no, go right ahead. Uh, this is another big part of your uh, responsibility, and that's uh, uh, NORTHCOM, NORAD, and, and missile defense. Last year, or excuse me, last week, we were down in Huntsville for the Space and Missile Defense uh, Symposium, and you highlighted in your remarks the importance of uh, the next generation interceptor, or NGI, for the rogue state ballistic missile threat. Uh, what, is, what is that? What does that mean to you, and, and why is it significant for, for the homeland? Yeah, so our ballistic missile defense capabilities are primarily focused on North Korea, DPRK. As we witnessed in October of uh, 20, on the 10th of October, they continue to develop advanced capabilities and capacity. So they're building their missiles out. Uh, the new KN-28, we saw a much larger capability, uh, and the total numbers of missiles uh, tends to increase. Next generation interceptor, uh, for the mission I'm given to defend our homeland, will continue to keep us on a successful path to maintain capacity to address the threat and also the capability as they develop uh, capabilities such as decoys or balloons that may be challenging the system. The next generation interceptor will give us that capability. Uh, I'm concerned that, uh, that we must develop it and, and field it on time. It's currently on track for 2028. Uh, the department with the Missile Defense Agency has uh, established a contract mechanism that will reward the timing of the fielding of the NGI and the capabilities. And so that's good. That's my top priority to make sure I can address the cap uh, capability and capacity. So you, you said schedule is your, your top priority for NGI, uh, but I can't help but think, and this, recognizing this is a, a policy discussion and not your, your call, but from where you sit, if NGI were to go away or if it were to be delayed to the right, what does that mean, uh, or if it were to be canceled altogether? What does that mean for you, and for, more importantly, for the Homeland Defense mission? Yeah, so Tom, you're exactly correct. Totally a policy decision, and I'll stay out of the politics or the policy aspect of that. What, what I would say is I feel like my job is to convey what the impact and risk would be of that decision, and convey that to the secretary and the chairman for their advice uh, to the, the key decision makers on that. Uh, I think that would put us a little bit more reliant on our strategic deterrence, Admiral Richard, uh, and his capabilities, uh, and it potentially uh, could increase the risk of strategic deterrence failure should there be an attack. I think what's crucial to realize about next generation interceptor and our ballistic missile defense capabilities and the other capabilities that I, d I haven't talked about is you have deterrence by punishment, which I did allude to. Uh, our ballistic missile defense capabilities are a part of what I call deterrence by denial. Uh, it's, it's the gray matter that somebody believes that they may not be able to achieve their objective because you have a denial capability and they know if they're denied their, uh, you know, their, their shot, their one time, uh, that what comes back from that is the, all the power and influence of the United States of America and our allies and partners. And so deterrence by denial is crucial. And so as you look at making decisions like you referred to, it is crucial to look at that, not in a vacuum, but more broadly on overarching strategic deterrence. And so, uh, you know, right now we have a chance to look at that as they're doing the nuclear posture review, they're doing a missile defense review, and those two should be looked at hand in hand for overarching deterrence. And, and one of the reasons you're emphasizing the schedule on NGI is we've had some programmatic setbacks over the past several years, as well as the, you know, we're not doing more, 20 more GBIs uh, instead, but uh, there's also the, the broader homeland ballistic missile defense, uh, GMD uh, program and enterprise that's deployed today. But I've heard you emphasize the importance of things between now and NGI. You've talked about the GMD SLEP. What's going on with that and why is that important? Well, SLEP is crucial. Uh, that gets us to NGI. SLEP, this is the first time the Missile Defense Agency has really uh, pulled our uh, ground-based interceptors out of the ground and done an end-to-end -end test of the system where they look at each and every component. That'll give us crucial reliability data 
uh, where we can now predict future reliability. What that does is it gives me the ability to potentially change shot doctrine, which gives additional capacity. And not only is uh, the Missile Defense Agency working with the contractor uh, on uh, the, that reliability aspect, but also adding additional capability, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail about that, to counter the potential uh, threats that I talked about earlier. So that will get us to uh, NGI, and that's crucial to maintain that service life extension. Great. Uh, now, the video you showed earlier, I mean, there was a lot going on in there, and it really highlighted some political and economic and, and military potential targets in, in North America. You know, one of the, one of the thornier questions and, and this kind of thing, whenever you're talking about a continental-wide target list, is, you know, what everything's critical or critical to some folks, but then you have to move from what is critical to what is actually going to be defended. And so back to the cruise missile side of the house, you know, the difference between a critical asset list and a defended asset list. Do you think we can get to uh, a defended asset list for the really critical things in the United States uh, homeland? Uh, do I think so? I, I do think we can. It's a tough, uh, tough discussion that's, that's had, been had for a while, uh, but I think it's crucial that we go down that path. Uh, like you mentioned, the critical asset list uh, exists. I think that we need to look not only across the Department of Defense, uh, but the whole of nation on what we must defend. And that's a policy issue that I've asked for. Uh, and it, when I say must defend, I'm talking uh, not only kinetically, but there are other means to uh, defend, such as using resiliency, cyber resiliency. Not every threat uh, is threatened kinetically. And we're a very resilient nation, uh, but uh, we need to figure out what our most strategic assets are and how we're going to defend those. You can utilize hardening, for example, for certain capabilities as well. But the goal would be, as you said, it's unaffordable and unrealistic to defend everything, is to figure out what those items we must defend are, and that contributes to that deterrence that I talked about earlier uh, of the homeland, creating doubt in their mind about ever bringing us to our knees with a strike on the homeland. Yeah. Um, but there's, you've alluded to them, there's barriers to get into that defended asset list. You've got FAA, you've got domestic legal, or, you know, uh, law enforcement entities as well. So what are the barriers to get into that? Well, I believe it's uh, having a sit down and a discussion and you don't have to identify every single uh, point in space that you want to defend. I think the barriers involve educating folks on the ability uh, to defend wide area spaces. So for example, um, future capabilities such as use of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, where you can defend a wider area than point defense with uh, a missile, for example, will give us the option to uh, lump into multiple large areas critical assets from across the entire interagency. Where, where you get into trouble and challenges is when you're trying to pick between one department's uh, pinpoint location and another's on the priority. Uh, I think we can move beyond that with future capabilities. Great. And then um, back to your two hats, and I'm just picturing you taking the hats on and off between NORAD and, and NORTHCOM. Um, what are the differences, and you've alluded to it to some extent already, between the different kinds of cruise missile and ballistic missile threats? And then what are some synergies, other than the fact you're wearing both hats as a human being, synergies between the entities between cruise missile and ballistic missile defense? Well, gosh, you know, cru cruise missiles are totally different than a ballistic missile threat today. Uh, cruise missiles uh, can be launched from multiple platforms, from uh, air launch capabilities to sea launch capabilities to submarine launch capabilities to container uh, on a commercial vessel. Uh, there, there's multiple ways to do that, where a ballistic missile uh, typically is going to be launched from some type of a, a rocket, an, a, a large IR plume that you're going to be able to detect. Oftentimes you will not see that with a cruise missile. Uh, domain awareness goes across both commands, uh, from uh, detecting of cruise missiles to detecting, detecting of ballistic missiles. So both hats, I absolutely need that domain awareness to where, uh, you, you know, to where I can attack, uh, when I say attack, uh, provide options to our senior leaders uh, to defend or deter against those uh, cruise missiles or ballistic missiles. So let me refer to another combatant command, uh, but, but one in which the conversation between those two uh, threat sets is very of the day. We heard about it last week, uh, and that is the defense of Guam. You know, we've got to worry about the defense of Guam for both the cruise missile problem and the 
ballistic missile problem because China's going to come at us with everything you know, on a bad day. So, you know, as you're tracking that, and that's Indo-PACOM's number one priority, the commander has said, that's his number one priority. Are there lessons and are there things that could be harvested from whatever efforts are done there that you might apply back here uh, at home? Lessons for uh, what Admiral Aquilino is doing? From, I can... from what Indo-PACOM is going to do. Yeah, I haven't really thought much about that. I, 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 certainly, I'm sure there's, there's some lessons there. But what we do back home uh, is, is purely a, a policy decision on what we're going to defend and how we're going to defend it. What I would like to do is invoke that discussion to make sure that we're at least making risk-informed decisions based on the threat that has changed over the last 10 years and will change going uh, forward. A Admiral Aquilino certainly has uh, the threats to Guam. He is in the region. He is uh, close to that uh, threat. I believe the culture believes that you know we're, we're a sanctuary here, and I want to force that discussion to happen. North America is a region, too. So you've just finished Guide 3. What's coming up next? Uh, or is there going to be a guide for what, what's the next steps that uh, going on here? I believe there will be a guide for. Um, we're going to talk uh, with the Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Hicks, about the way forward within a week or so. Uh, I, I plan to uh, try to move as quickly as possible to field these capabilities. You may remember my article is uh, entitled Build a Bike While You Ride It. I believe these capabilities uh, can, can warrant uh, fielding them different testing processes for software, the legacy testing processes that we go through for weapons platforms, uh, where you have to do developmental test and operational test before you field it. Uh, there are valid reasons to do that. For software-based things where we're not actually pulling the trigger uh, necessarily immediately, it's a decision maker still doing that, I think we can move forward to, uh, to uh, field this quickly with a uh, next spring validation through one of our globally integrated exercises. But you're looking, again, Moving, it's, it's, that's another experiment, another exercise, but presumably you're looking in the near term to hand this off to somebody to build and implement. Absolutely, Tom. That would be part of the discussion with the Deputy Secretary. Uh, for for long term, uh, you know, as a combatant commander, I'm not in the acquisition and capability development uh, uh, job. And so I'd love to hand this off to somebody uh, as long as we can keep it on the path it's been on. When you go from December till July, and develop the capabilities, and you're up, updating them every 14 days uh, and utilizing those processes. I think that's a, a model for the future that we need to look at. What I don't want to do is go backwards and start using uh, annual or even FIDEP type processes uh, for the capabilities that we can field today. Well, look, we've covered a, a lot of ground. Uh, I want to see if there's anything else you felt we haven't covered or anything you want to uh, talk about for the, for the, for the near-term future. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about Homeland Defense. Uh, defense of North America and the capabilities that, uh, that we're developing. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, culture and education are two things that I'm really focused on, educating uh, folks on the threat to the homeland and embracing a digital culture going forward to adapt our processes and also to adapt to a global mindset and an all-domain mindset. And so uh, we've moved the ball a long way. So a lot of people involved. I'm uh, encouraged by what I see. Uh, but we're not there, and I'm not ready to spike the ball just yet. Okay. Well, thank you, General Van Herk. Really appreciate it. Uh, and please give our best from CSIS to the uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Hicks while you're over there. So, And thanks, everybody, uh, online. I appreciate your, uh, your tuning in and, and submitting questions. We've worked through a number of them. And uh, uh, please uh, come back soon. Thanks.